MTV in the 2000s had such a large array of different, weird, wild, and ridiculous shows that my first video on MTV shows from this era could barely scratch the surface. And heck, maybe today's video doesn't do that either. But today, we are going to head back to this misunderstood Wild West era of MTV where the most random, the most hardcore, the most whatever this is type of shows exist and in some cases thrived. From clearly staged reality shows, allegedly, to legacy building shows, to the shows that inspired a generation of kids and teens to pick up a camera and film themselves and their friends getting hurt. Welcome to the wild side of MTV in the 2000s. Why isn't Pluto a planet anymore? Pluto's not a planet anymore? Punked. Literally, this show is single-handedly responsible for prank-based YouTube videos and people yelling out, it's just a prank, bro, and I stand by that. Especially if we go by the show's original name. It fits the vibe of what those YouTube prank videos would be. Harassment. Punked really is a staple into this era of realizing that you can take cameras outside and shoot the real world and make it a show of sorts. And we can even make that show dunking on the people who would least expect to get dunked on at that time. Celebrities. <laughs> There was a time where there was this separation between the average everyday person and a celebrity because of this boundary between us and them. But thanks to social media and more instant access, the boundary and illusion is essentially gone. So to have a show pranking the most famous people at the time and watching them act with human emotions to certain situations could be pretty gratifying sometimes. <laughs> A weird celebrity diatribe aside, the show's premise was simple. Ashton Kutcher, who would host the show, would lead the production crew to put together elaborate setups surrounding whatever celebrity they can track down to put them in a situation and see how they react, most times with the hopes of an angry or emotionally distressed response. Okay, you know, maybe this show or concept was pretty messed up, but it's okay. In the end, Hollywood nice guy Ashton Kutcher comes out to tell the celeb that they just got punked. I got punked, man. Man, I got it's always okay to mess with someone's emotions as long as you film it and claim it was all a joke. From Frankie Muniz to George Lopez to Justin Timberlake to our good buddies the Ying Yang Twins. A vast variety of celebs would be featured on the show. Sometimes these celebs would help Ashton punk other celeb friends or even fill in for him as a guest host from time to time. Like I mentioned, the show was originally going to be called Harassment and with a pretty similar concept minus the celebrity part, the show would prey on regular people with some even more messed up uh, pranks. Like a couple who were at the Las Vegas Hard Rock Hotel finding a dead body. That's so fun, right? Well, that emotional distress ended in a lawsuit for $10 million against Ashton Kutcher, MTV, and the hotel. So that version of the show shot in 2002 it never came to be. But the following year, the show would become punked because why would rich celebrities sue? They're rich and they want to look perfect in the public eye. Some of my favorite parts would be the kid who interviews at special events as I thought they were pretty good. Definitely a lot more harmless in the grand scheme of things, so that's nice. Oh, you're the cutest thing. Can you go from Beverly Hills, right? No, no, honey. That's okay. But the end of the original run of the show would finish off with this special punked award show before the series would come back in 2012, with different celebrity hosts who were really popular at the time getting their own episodes to prank other celebs and their friends. People from Bam Margera to Miley Cyrus to Tyler the Creator to Justin Bieber and many more all took the reins to host the show, even having Ashton come back for an episode for old time's sake. While this version didn't last that long, this show just didn't want to die. Pranking content was big on YouTube, but the mainstream seemed to not care as much for it on TV. BET would then try their hand at a reboot a few years later with King Batch and Daystorm Power, which was reaching right into the online sector of entertainment. Again, this version didn't last long either, but another chance was given, literally. Thanks to the now dead content platform Quibi, Punked came back, hosted by Chance the Rapper. And while he had a big day with the show having its resurgence, death, and re-resurgence on the Roku app once Quibi died, nothing has seemed to come from it since. Ah, okay, let's cleanse the palate a little bit after punked. 
Where it would be in the spirit of making people mad, let's now look at people being made. With MTV's Made, a show that would focus on different young people and help build them into the career field that they want to be in. I want to see if I could take my wisecracking to the next level, maybe even a career. It's labeled as a self-improvement show, as each person would have a made coach that would fit within their specific field of expertise the main focus of the episode would be. As we then spend the next month or two within an episode with them, seeing how well they work towards their life goals. From athletes to musicians to filmmakers, the show did a great job at bringing you into the world of the next generation, giving you a time capsule look into the, at the time, landscape of where these people wanted to be and what they wanted to be. If this show were still going on, I bet there would be episodes about making people into content creators or streamers, which in a way, can kind of be all of that depending on what hobbies or interests you'd want to showcase online. Like if you want to be a mechanic, there's nothing stopping you from making a YouTube channel where you get to showcase your hobby of putting together a car or streaming you working in your garage on a car. So now the possibilities are kind of endless with what you can do. It's kind of shy, comes off a little awkward. I need some serious help with the ladies. But the show would run for 11 years from 2003 to 2014 with 280 episodes in total. And so the overlap of ambitions was pretty constant as the seasons would go on, where some would have some pretty ambitious dreams they'd want to achieve and some, well, they just want to be the homecoming queen. Although it can feel repetitive, having a pretty standard format, just with situations and goals changing, it overall has a good inspiring vibe to it that really contrasts heavily to a lot of the, uh, well, other content on MTV. Nothing sold quite like seeing other people in terror on TV. I mean, Fear Factor was all the rage at one point, and now we've upgraded as a society to do these no-look box challenges because we never learn. So taking some factors out, we are left with just fear. <laughs> A show that would test contestants' fright tolerances by being left at haunted locations, or at least stated haunted locations, where over the course of a couple nights, the contestants would start out at a safe house, which would be the only part of the area not haunted, coincidentally, and everyone would be tasked with challenges or dares, and if someone is too freaked out and wants to leave and can't complete their dare, they lose their share of the prize money, and in the end, if there are people left, they collect $5,000. Oh my god, I can't believe I'm going out again. Two nights in a scary location location where off screen there's probably a full staff of production crew somewhere to help me if things got bad for real to win 5k? That's so easy. Maybe that's just me being cocky, or maybe that's just me not being a bit. Honestly, stuff like this sounds really fun. The challenges would range from your average ghost hunting stuff to then doing things that would probably disrespect the dead and okay, maybe at that point I'd only be uncomfortable because of the disrespect. <laughs> But they did get to shoot the show at some fun locations for the 16 episodes that it ran for two seasons. Military bases, aircraft carriers, private resorts, penitentiaries, sanatoriums. All that seems like a fun time with some spectacular specters if you'd ask me. But they didn't. I was a kid at the time this show came out, but I would have been a contestant in a heartbeat. Okay, okay, Pimp My Ride is one of the most famous shows from this era. It needs no real introduction, but we will show it respect and give it one. Since Josh loves a snowboard, a seven inch monitor in your board. Ooh. Car culture, specifically when it comes to customization and tricked out whips, was huge in the 2000s. MTV wanted to showcase this through a mixed reality medium, which I will get into, but Exhibit, the host of the show who taught me about the difference between me and you, and that's five bank accounts, three ounces, and two vehicles. But he also taught me about pimping out some rides, turning some of the most generic, boring cars you'd see on the road, and having West Coast Customs turn them into some impractical jokes of actual use. But hey, they look really cool, and I guess that's all that matters. We have your airplane signs for your hijacks. This was the most commented thing on my previous video to cover, which of course I had it on my list. But I'm glad to see so many people have an interest in discussing it with me today. The concept of this show is very simple. We start out seeing a person in their car, which wouldn't be great, it would be falling apart, and it would be their plea asking for their ride to be pimped, where Exhibit shows up as a surprise to that person's house. <laughs> Oh, okay, that's it, give me the keys. He takes their car, brings it to West Coast Customs, and the car would transform in front of your eyes from basic to ballin', from busted to bussin'. 
I just threw up in my mouth. But we would get to see all the little details they would make from their conception, how it could be made to the final product being ready to be shown off to the person when they would come back in to pick up their car. It's so simple. But why was there so much controversy around this show? Well, apparently, so much of this supposed real show was fake, allegedly. Some people who were on the show would claim this to be true, or even from the get-go where the houses we would meet the car owners at to what the condition of their car truly is in when they show it off before the pimpening. The reactions of seeing the final cars would be shot multiple times, being helped by the production for the contestants to act more surprised or excited when they see their car, rather than any sort of real authentic reaction. Oh, baby! What you think? I don't even know what I'm thinking, man. Check this out. But the biggest thing here would be the loss of access to their car. So this whole pimping process, well, it would take around a month and a half to do. Not the quick couple day turnaround the show makes it seem like, with the person whose car this is being left to figure out their own transportation with no help in the meantime. Which you may be able to forgive if you look at it from the perspective of, oh, well, you're getting this sick brand new version of your car for free. But what if that free car you get back is, uh is worse. When it came to the cars themselves, they would be filled with a bunch of non-practical and useless features that wouldn't even match who the person who owns the car is. But we would be made to believe the opposite sometimes, from staging personal stories so the crew can make something in the car that looks cool to us, but truly means nothing to the person who gets it back, or even random things that would be inside jokes or personal jabs at the owner of the vehicle. But beyond that, just driving them would be a problem, with some of them now just weighing too much that they would constantly get scraped, stuck, or just not work as a functional, practical car. Now, again, I say allegedly, but hey, at least it's reported that Exhibit was a nice person, and that's all that matters, right? You know, X, I can't thank you enough. The show was a big deal for the network, being one of their most popular shows and ran for six seasons, with the final two seasons no longer having West Coast Customs be the car pimpers, but instead Galpin Auto Parts, or Gas. Hey, remember Nickelodeon Gas, you know, games and sports? Well, I'm working on a big video for that sometime this year. Just a random early teaser for you. Now, something I really didn't touch on in my last video was that MTV would have other versions of the same show for different territories around the world. And of course, Pimp My Ride was no stranger to that. With Pimp My Ride UK, Pimp My Ride International, Pimp My Ride Brazil, Pimp My Ride Baltic, Pimp My Ride France, and Pimp My Car Indonesia. I don't know what happened to that last one with the title scheme there. But MTV would take the pimp in further when it came to other countries too, with the best titled one, Pimp my whatever. And hey, look, a video game where you can ghost ride the whip. <laughs> Neat. I guess you can say, <laughs> pimping ain't easy. I just threw up in my mouth again. All right. <laughs>Speaking of rappers, the influence of rap music in the 90s and 2000s was huge, so of course Hollywood was there to try and make profitable cringe with it, downright disrespecting it and making celebrities look even worse than you could think. I present to you, Celebrity Rap Superstar. to the wide, to the blue, God bless America. A show that would take eight celebrities as they would be coached by rappers themselves to perform songs where viewers would vote for them to make it to the next round. Yeah, this show didn't last long. Only one season with eight episodes. But they sure did stuff it with things to watch. I want to see some panties <laughs> dropping. Over the eight weeks, these eight contestants featuring people like Kendra Wilkerson and Perez Hilton. No, not Paris Hilton. That Simple Life video is in the works, everyone. Relax. But like I said instead we have Perez Hilton great what I do wrong everything they would all get trained by coaches like too short MC light Warren G bizarre red man Bubba Sparks tone Loke, and corrupt to perform a bunch of hit rap songs with each week having a specific rule like performing a song they rehearsed perform one they wrote or even have to learn to fast rap when twist to stop by as a guest judge in the end Char Jackson would win after going up against Kendra and the judges for the show would be big boy to and DMC, which was cool, but did you know that Kevin Hart was a host of this show? Oh, and uh, speaking of DMC, Whose house? Run's house. As the other half of Run DMC, Rev Run would have his own family-based reality show on the network. Go to your room, 
Go to your room. You go do what you want. Here, the cameras would follow Run and his family, from him and the majority of his family being in New Jersey and filming in Manhattan. Now, why did they need to follow Run's life and household specifically? What was the special hook here? Hope floats, so let it rise. I really can't tell you that. As far as Run DMC goes, I'm a big fan and grew up being shown their music. But here, the show would just follow this family as they deal with family things. And sometimes, some incredibly personal moments like allowing the camera crew to be in the hospital when they lost a baby at birth and how the family reacts to it. Love each other, continue to go to church like we do, and we'll still have a family. The most interesting hook for the show that I can find was that Run, who was this incredibly important to hip-hop rapper, became this ordained minister as he sends out words of wisdom from his Blackberry while living in luxury. Which, hey, I have nothing wrong with that. Enjoy the riches you've earned in life, by all means. But when you hear things like, who said a man of God is supposed to drive a Pinto? As he was speaking to his congregation, and then following up with, the money's all supposed to go to the doctors and lawyers, and the man of God is broken down on the highway? He's God's sacred person, and he can't live good? All right, Kenneth Copeland, relax. It's unbecoming for a preacher to live a life of luxury. It takes a lot of money to do what we do. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. God bless, Father bless Lisa today. But again, nothing wrong with enjoying your riches, no matter what field you work in, or in this case, gave yourself to. But like, I don't think one thing automatically makes you deserving of being just ridiculously rich. Your music did that, which is great, but why am I no longer getting words of wisdom on my Blackberry? <laughs> From one house to another house, MTV's movie house was the place to be. I want to see the sickness, man. Bring the sickness. Where it would be this place to get exclusive access to behind the scenes of movies, the people involved, and even audience reactions of screenings of the hottest, newest films, like 8 Mile at the time. If you can do it in rap, you can do it as an actor. There we would get some information from Eminem about his time making the film, as the host would talk about some fun facts, and even more information about the actor's career, or in this case, like Eminem, his music career, his music video shoots, and more. What's up, movie house? Thank you for coming out. Or you'd have celebrities speaking to celebrities, like Master P asking Hayden Christensen if he is going to win Kiss of the Year. Think you're going to be up for Kiss of the Year? It was an alright kiss. Or this. She's, she's a, a pretty girl. It wasn't, wasn't that hard to do. You hear <laughs> yeah, it was clearly a time to be alive. From special preview clips to instant theater reactions, Movie House would be all about the movies, and as a movie fan, yeah, I'm at home here. Especially when we would cut away to these video store segments and check out the latest movies to rent and watch on VHS with a bunch of recommendations. And all of this was hosted by the most 2000s person that I couldn't have fathomed to try and come up with in my head, Nick Zano. You guys have been great, and I've been Nick Zano. God bless this show. Probably the most influential show of my generation, Jackass really took doing random and dumb stuff with your friends to a whole new level. A lot of Shaq humping Wee Man. From sheer stupidity to unsuspecting pranks, Jackass was the definition of every one of your friends living up to the name of the show. It's perfect counterculture reality TV, or maybe anti reality. It's stuff like other casual vote off romance shows, singing competitions, and whatever something like parental control is. Check out my last MTV video for that show. And we consider all of that reality, while it's allegedly highly planned out or manipulated to be something, Jackass would show you a side of society where this group of degenerates actually, with no BS, were all about really getting hurt and truly performing the stunts seen on screen. It didn't matter if the show stated that these were professionals. No, they weren't. At least not at first. Leading to so many kids and teens to pick up cameras and film each other doing their own stunts. And the rise of video sharing platforms really helped showcase this. Thanks to Johnny Knoxville wanting to find some sort of work in Hollywood to take care of his family, going as far as to test out all these self-defense products on himself, because whatever it takes to make it in La La Land, he was willing to endure physical pain when no one would cover this because of the major liabilities he was contacted by Jeff Tremaine, who at the time worked as an editor on the skateboarding magazine Big Brother. This is where everything really started coming together. Jeff wanted Johnny to go through with this torturous performance and said it should be filmed. He was sprayed with pepper spray, hit with a taser, and tested out a bulletproof vest. I'm Johnny Knoxville, United States of America. Hit me! <laughs> with connections from other contributors at Big Brother, such as Wee Man, Dave England, Steve O, and Chris Pontius. But obviously, there are still some major puzzle pieces missing.
Enter the CKY crew, a mixture of everything counterculture at the time. What weren't they? A rock band? Yeah. A group of skateboarders? Yeah. A bunch of knuckleheads with a camera filming pranks and stunts with each other? Absolutely. This is where we get to meet Bam Margera, an on-the-rise professional skateboarder located in Westchester, Pennsylvania, along with his friends Ryan Dunn, Brandon DiCamillo, Brandon Novak, Rake Yan, Rab himself, and different members of Bam's family, which would play a larger factor in a different series that we will talk about shortly. These CKY videos would be legendary underground-esque tapes that would heavily influence the way skaters showed off their personalities, and it wasn't long before Jeff caught wind of this and wanted to meet with Bam, resulting in thinking him and the rest of CKY would be this perfect fit for this new show he was putting together with both Johnny Knoxville and Spike Jones. which I just think it's so funny how Spike does all of this work in front of and behind the camera for everything Jackass related, but then will go and make films like Being John Malkovich, Adaptation, and Her. It's almost as funny as the Mad Max series director George Miller also making the Happy Feet movies. A short demo would send three networks into a bidding war for who wants the show the most, FX, Comedy Central, and MTV. MTV would prove to offer the strongest deal to them, where creative control would be more so in their hands than the networks, which alone is a massive deal, especially when dealing with such an offbeat show. Finally, the crew would round off with people like Danger Aaron and Preston Lacey, and this group would go on to live in history as the biggest idiots with the biggest balls put to television, and eventually, the big screen. This show blew up. The views and the ratings were through the roof for the network, as what can you even say you're watching? It was the Wild West for trying new things on TV, and oh boy, was this different than any other show on TV at the time. Half of the stuff that they would do, I can't even describe, as it would be visual vomit-inducing or cringeworthy, only in the aspect of feeling the pain in the places they were receiving it in. I can handle 99% of anything that they have ever shown, but there is one moment from all of the jackass media out there that physically makes me feel pain, and it hurts me to watch. You know the webbing between your fingers and toes? You know how sensitive those areas are and all that? But what if you got paper cuts there? Willingly. Yeah, that's what keeps me up at night. That and still waiting for my words of wisdom message on my Blackberry. Where is it? But the show brought on some attention from the wrong people. Regardless of the warnings plastered throughout the show, a Connecticut senator named Joe Lieberman, yeah, this goober, wanted smoke with MTV, trying to get them to be more responsible with airing shows like this in efforts to protect the children. Which, yeah, I get it. But also, the warnings protect this. It's also a show that's provided as entertainment, and hey, parents should be protecting their kids more so than the government interfering with what a network can or can't show, especially if it's already falling under the legal guidelines. Sadly, this caused MTV, while under this criticism, to push the show back to later night airings and stop a lot of the reruns of older episodes, which of course didn't sit right with the crew and stars of the show, and this is what caused the show's 25 episode run to be cut there. But not long after, MTV would still help put together and produce Jackass the Movie, bringing everyone back together for this farewell to the series, and for this whole idea as a whole. Yeah, sadly, this was going to be the end for this concept, but it was going to go out in style with a movie, so that's not too bad, I guess. But when your film ends up at number one at the box office, making over $60 million in the US alone on a $5 million budget, yeah, you come back together and make more of this. With the sequel movie coming out four years later in 2006, a 3D third movie in 2011, and a fourth movie titled Forever in 2022, in which that one served as a real goodbye for from the original older cast for the most part, as we would also meet a new generation of younger daredevils who grew up on the original show. There were spin-off movies like Bad Grandpa, Matt Hoffman's tribute to Evil Knievel, the Gumball 3000 rally special, and even special documentaries for each movie featuring even more stunts labeled as point fives. And there was even a video game. But it's what else was spawned from this jackass cinematic and telematic universe that really made us build relationships to other people from the show even more. While some would be larger than others, some smaller shows like Homewrecker would come out, with Ryan Dunn hosting I'm Ryan Dunn from Viva Bam. I'm here to help you get revenge on a jerk in your life who has done you wrong. Or Blastazoid, where Brandon and Rake and another CKY member, Joe France, were trying to make a live-action version of video games that you can physically play, along with being a clip show of funny, user-generated video game-inspired clips, as they put it. Check it out. But there were two major shows that spawned legs of their own from this initial crew. And first, First, probably the most popular one being... Viva La Bam. Yeah. This was just CKY if CKY was given a budget to do whatever they wanted to do. By the way, 
<laughs> Bam Margera was quite the fan favorite among so many out there, enjoying his bad boy look with his goofy and extremely reckless attitude. All the show would be is Bam, along with his friends and family, just doing things. Most times there is some goal that Bam has to create or do something for that episode to make it interesting, but all the other stuff would be filled in with them pulling pranks on his parents, making Don Vito have an unintelligible fit, and a little bit of skateboarding for good measure, of course. But I can't understate the amount of money that was flowing in from MTV for this show. From the massive upgrade from the house to the castle in season two, to the funding of the ridiculous ideas he had. You wanna go? <laughs> yeah. Well, let me land. Like building a giant treehouse casino, a skate park. In fact, he got around $300,000 an episode to spend 260,000 of it on whatever he wanted. Literally turning this whole castle and property into Bam's own version of a fantasy factory before the real Rob Deerdeck era of MTV was coming. While the show over the five seasons would ramp up in the amount of pranks, the annoying the parental figures moments, and the all out chaos sometimes, there was a clear shift happening from Bam the skateboarder to Bam the guy just doing crazy things for the camera. <laughs> His skateboarding took a back seat to the show and the entertainment side of his life, which would ultimately affect him later on beyond this. But he made sure to do more and more crazy things with the concepts of what him and his friends are doing that day. And God save you if you were Bam's family, as sleeping, eating, and even going to the restroom could result in Bam pranking you, or him beating you up, or him just in general making your life constantly filled with dread, making sure you keep one eye open when you sleep. <laughs> Filled with celebrity cameos of friends from every aspect of the entertainment and sports industries, Bam was having the time of his life and was trying to keep up this lifestyle until it was time to take a break from filming. Ending the show, but with the constant buildup of more from Bam being thrust more into entertainment than just skateboarding, really just becoming this brand that can sell without him really riding as much? How could you want to stop it? Money from his branding, his shows, the video games he was in, TV commercials, you name it, Bam was loaded with cash and maybe a Around the same time as the second Jackass movie, he found the one thing that could fill a void he didn't know that was there. Wild Boys was exactly what the title describes it as, with our two hosts being Steve-O and Chris Pontius giving their unique take on travel and animal shows by getting history lessons in both different cultures Aha! This is from my weed- and the various animals around the world. <laughs> along with being right in the strike zone, acting as test dummies when some of these animals may attack. Don't worry, that was perfectly safe. So yeah, there were still a bunch of stunts, just more so focusing on pain tolerance from both of these wild boys. They were tempting fate on more than one occasion, and it was all for our enjoyment. But through this pain and suffering, we got to learn. Ah, uh, the average shark is about 12, 12 foot and a thousand pounds. Yes, we would legitimately get to learn about these areas we would visit, the animals that live there, and any of the traditions that we would take place in with these two. While most of the shows like this, like The Crocodile Hunter, were more so solely educational based, with at least Steve Irwin still getting very hands-on, Steve-O and Chris, well, they're not so knowledgeable, and they lack the proper training and readiness to be in these situations. <laughs> Why do I have to be so fat? <laughs> That was awesome, dude. Jeff Tremaine would follow over to this show and serves the same role, and it would become its own little show that still had all the spirit of the last one, especially since previous cast members and friends would show up sometimes. But Wild Boys would come to an end, especially once they realized that at what point are they just making a derivative of their previous show? And with the sequel movie happening, what would be the point? But to still keep that Wild Boys theme living on, certain stunts in Jackass number two would specifically be in relation to the Wild Boys, and all was right in the world. The show came full circle, and hopefully everyone had a good time. A painful time, but hopefully a good one. Hey, Bam found that void he was missing. A significant other. This is not Viva La Bam. This is your wedding show. So now we get the sequel series to Viva La Bam called Bam's Unholy Union. And for the majority of the content within it, it was your usual Viva La Bam lifestyle with pranks and stunts. But now we get this nicer, more relaxed, for the most part, side where his bride-to-be, Missy, was working with Bam's mother to get things ready and plan their wedding. If you don't want to have a big wedding, we don't have to have a big wedding. Seriously, don't. Bam! 
It was the taming of the skater boy, but everything would fall apart for the show and end after one season once the producers of the show wanted Bam and Missy to get pregnant and focus on having a baby for season two, either that or fake a pregnancy. But in addition to this being the final straw, Missy was not meant for the entertainment world and disliked being on TV. So to ask for something so personal, to just lay it all out there on full display for television was not going to happen. I can't believe you're having second thoughts. So the show would end after one season and the Viva La Bam era, at least in this sense, was over. Much like our stunt-filled cast of Daredevils, they helped introduce their motorized counterparts, Nitro Circus. Is she okay? <laughs> a group of daredevils that take on action sports mainly being known for their dirt bike stunts, but not being limited to just that. For the stuff that they would do in the show, an eventual 3D film in theaters seeing the success of the 3D Jackass movie. <laughs> Led by Travis Pastrana, it would just be a lot more of the crazy stuff you'd like from the other guys, just now with a lot more airtime and different kinds of risks. It's a fun time if you like daredevils that are trying to actually perform cool stunts without getting hurt instead of people performing stunts in the goal of getting hurt. Last episode of the MTV Look Back, we talked about Next. This weird, totally real show. Real was an air quotes if you couldn't hear it in my voice. And now we're talking about Exposed, as this was seen as the next version of Next, the spiritual successor, or the spiritual suck sucker. Yo, you got me in that, Jordan? Because, oh baby, the RV is back. No longer is the Next bus around. We have the Exposed RV that would be disguised in plain sight with some high-tech gizmos, gadgets, and whoozy what's it. They're all just there for show, of course, as a friend would sit in the RV and monitor the dates their friend would go on. Earpiece, so he can hear me when I rat these girls out. And communicate with them through an earpiece to let them know when the dates are lying about something, thanks to this lie detector technology or whatever. If you're wondering if the dialogue in this show, when the people talk to the camera, is that good old MTV cringe? Well, <laughs> you'd be absolutely correct. Yeah, let's do this. Ah! Do you get lime disease from eating limes? <laughs> no, I've got the booty. Do you like? Yes. Devin, you've lied. Oh. We even get these moments where the dates would smack talk each other. I'm so much hotter than you. Have you been to the gym lately? Do some push-ups. Yeah, I've seen better acting on other websites. And here, there is nothing more than the bad acting. It's all cringe and totally not real. Allegedly. God, these shows were just so cheap to make, but I think that's why I find them oddly charming. Like, just look at this set. We were just on the edge of this public beach, shooting this awkward dialogue-driven scene where they talk on this couch bed thing, and since the guy here is British, they have a fake Big Ben in the background. Why are you looking all seductive while taking that banger? What's all that about? It's just so delicious. I can't play with props. I like the real thing. Can we have a check, please? This show is literally just shoot wherever the RV pulls up to. The friend in the RV would tell the dater to ask some very forward questions to test the date's lies or truth-telling abilities, all unbeknownst to the dates who are being subjected to these tests. Are her <laughs> real? Are your <laughs> real though? They're really nice. Ah! Let me see. No. Ready? Nice. He said nice. Ah! But then once the data reveals it and offers them one last chance to tell the truth, right at the end to see if there were any lies they want to come forward about. I've got to tell you that you've both been exposed. Is there anything you want to come clean about, Gracie? It comes down to, is he going to pick the honest person? It really doesn't matter. The dater here picks whoever they want based on their own merits. Devin. Oh! Bessler. Good riddance. I'm gonna go party! It doesn't matter if you were more truthful, if your lies were just somehow more appealing and he knows they were lies but just still likes you, he's gonna pick you. Get exposed! <laughs> The Big Urban Myth Show was like YouTube deep dives today into the most random and seemingly unimportant mysteries to ones that you're not sure if what you're being fed is the truth. Like so many myths with Tupac, we believe it. Hosted by Allison Hannigan, we would cut to random experiments that live on for a couple of minutes, from toilet seat testing, we swap this toilet at a popular college bar, to gang-related traditions, flashing your lights lead to your life flashing before your eyes. The show had a very simple premise, mixed with some of that 2000s fast-paced editing, and the use of so many popular rap songs at the time, while we have doctors or scientists debunk facts about everything while random people on the street or on college campuses would be asked their opinions on whatever matter was being brought up. I have no idea, I've never licked a toad. 
good. <laughs> you know, even though it's really not that ridiculous of a show, there is some fun here with the quick paced editing and hopefully real enough facts that you get to learn something new you didn't know before you watched. With the pattern of MTV reality shows, something like Sorority Life was inevitable, right? I'm a big weirdo, so... <laughs> well, while the show focuses on sororities, their pledges, and all the drama that comes with that, this show was not nearly as wild as the time, setting, and idea that producers probably had it in mind to be. And I just want you all to know that this is going to be the pledge house. But it still lasted for a few seasons, focusing on different school sororities, and yeah, this show was just kind of boring in hindsight. Same goes to Fraternity Life, a spin-off that now focuses on fraternities. And just like the other show, it's not as wild as it sounds. Bully Gosh Darn Beatdown, created by hit showmaker Mark Burnett. And the premise here was super simple. Bullies, we kill, we cook, we eat. That's what we do. Well, they're bad, okay? So instead of fighting back against them yourself, why not give the bullies a chance to fight a real professional MMA fighter? I'm gonna make him respect pain. For the chance to win $10,000. So wait, on the off chance my bully beats up Tyrone Woodley, they get to look cool and make a lot of money? Huh. That sounds like some kid out of Ohio's literal life seeing something like that happen. Anyway, the show would be hosted by Jason Mayhem Miller. Hey, no, look, man, I'm not gonna beat you up in your mama's house, all right? A red-striped MMA fighter himself who would bring you into the world of the octagon in front of this crowd. Yes, this show has all the staple MTV cringe dialogue. The totally fake, I mean, allegedly fake, stories, bullies, and setups, I mean, come on. Humiliated for life, I fall down the stairs and get hurt. We get to meet the victims and their pleas to MMA fighters to help them with their bullies. I'm only five foot six. And then getting a chance to meet their bullies and see where they're coming from. First off, you know, I'm pretty awesome. And during the actual fight, both rounds give the bully a chance at $5,000 a piece. That is, if they can make it through the whole round, but tap outs and breaks make them lose some money. But if they quit and get knocked out, then they lose it all. And any lost money in general goes to the victims that they were bullying. You're gonna regret it, buddy. You're going down. Get your chin in, fat boy. Let's get on! They get beat up, they get some money, and hopefully give an apology to whoever that they were bullying. And after three seasons, the host himself, again, who was an MMA fighter, would finally jump in and beat down the bully himself. All right, let's do this. <laughs> We love a good twist. Look, let's be honest here. We, you and I, can enjoy something as not great as this type of content is and admit to it being such. But we also have to agree how not real it is, okay? You ready to get punked and bullied? The bullies themselves would have been found out to be stuntmen or actors in some cases with the alleged belief that the bullies and the victims may not have even really known each other aside from whatever story they have to play into. <laughs> Not really. Jason Mayhem Miller, however, is a strong defender of the show being real, and that the fights were legit because they were from people who genuinely thought that they could beat up MMA fighters, calling out people who claim the show is fake to be nothing more than a troll. Well, I guess I got a new nickname then. I'm just your trustworthy Trollden Fringe. Just like that movie Avatar, except without the stupid glasses! The Andy Milanakes Show. I really don't know how to describe it. It's like inhaling earth-grown enlightenment mixed with a fever dream and humor that was either way too ahead of its time or something that you weren't supposed to ever get. Guess what? You're the thousandth delivery guy! Whoa! <laughs> Let me give you your prize, hold on. You want a pizza? <laughs> From random in apartment, apartment skits with Andy and his cast of random people to going out on the street and talking to the public. You want to audition to be in a play? Yes? No. Andy's whole show was saying something without something to say, while at the same time having something to say, but not saying something. If that did make sense, then good, you understand the show. If that didn't make sense, good, you understand the show. That's not to confuse you, that's just how it is. It's a letter from your parents. Blub. Aside from dropping a theme song that if you don't know the lyrics, you still feel like you know the lyrics, Andy was a rapper himself and would have a bunch of guests on the show, with most being musicians and even then, most being rappers. What you gonna do, you? You're really, really here! 
The show was literally labeled a show with nothing to offer, not even the entertainment value. There is no, I highly stress the word no, no structure. But on the other side of things, you can get a review highly praising it with a take that says Andy Milanakis' brand of humor is particularly daunting because so little of it has a context anyone living outside of his head can seriously relate to. And I feel that is so genuinely accurate in the best way possible. I want to spank you and that's kind of weird. You're not in on the joke. You could just view this as a strange dude living a strange life and you get to be a fly on the wall observing him. What you call me? It certainly is one of the shows of all time. Uh, speaking of going off the rails... We're on the crazy train. We have to talk about another family-based reality show following a musician in an older age dealing with their interesting family where here, the Osbournes... I was like... Feel like there is actually some drama making the show more interesting than some other reality shows to get you to tune in. Whether it's Ozzy yelling out for his wife Sharon. Come on, Sharon! From across the house or him having to deal with his kids. Can you get this this television to work? You gotta have like computer knowledge to turn the TV on. Jeff! Ozzy's life post Black Sabbath and the majority of his solo music career found himself at MTV and suddenly families around the US, most likely your parents if you were my age, were watching the life of Ozzy as they grew up with him as a musician in their younger years. <laughs> parents, they're old. <laughs> Jokes aside, the show is just yelling, mumbling, cursing, and some serious moments thrown in there. With health scares and Ozzy, well, he would just get into stuff and sometimes just get hurt. The kids, however, are a completely different case, where the son Jack is just a prick. Why don't you shut the f up? And Kelly, well, she loves the fame. Kelly, stop throwing my Prada jacket. Okay, but I'm here now. I've got to go. I'm sorry. Kelly wanted to be famous. I never did. But they did have another daughter who refused to be on the show, and if they were ever around, they'd be blurred out. So I'm sure there was a lot of fun with that. While the excitement only comes from the drama of the family and the clashing personalities, the Osbournes would get used to living this way on camera. You look like Harrison Ford. Thanks a lot. After the show would end, after four seasons, they found themselves in constant shows. Like game shows or slightly different reality shows than the one they started out with. They got addicted to the life of daily vlogging minus the holding up the camera themselves. And they just stuck with it. So at least there's that. And it pays off the joke in Austin Powers at least. Same jokes they did in the last Austin Powers. And yes, they are still making shows today. I can't stress saying that part enough. The Osbournes are eternal. <laughs> Now we can't get to the end of this wild side of MTV video without at least mentioning the long lasting Wild and Out. Check it, yo. <laughs> A show created by Nick Cannon who has hosted it ever since, and while now the series is still running today over on VH1 instead of MTV, with now over 300 episodes, the show has always felt like a group of friends having fun roasting each other in various challenges between two teams, the red team and the black team, that would often feature a guest thrown in the mix. Of course, a musical performance at the end, whether they were a part of the other team, and in the games throughout the show, or just popping up at the end. Once you lost Mariah, you know you lost lost it all. First it went your talent, along with your career. I used to be a big fan of the show, and when I say I used to, I don't mean that in the oh this show is bad now type of way. I mean that is, I just stopped watching the show at some point. Probably when the show originally ended in 2007, before coming back a long while later. So in that interim, I just, I, I fell off. Where you going dog? I know in more recent days, people from YouTube or Vine and hey, who knows, maybe even from TikTok at this point are on the show. And I think that's cool how both old school and new school collide like this. The games they would do back and forth would consist of improvised jokes where you would have to try your best and sometimes you crush it and you hear the ding noise for a point given <laughs> or you bomb and you hear the X sound with booze from the crowd. Mama gonna be mad that you buzzed that. But it's fast. You gotta go with the flow, and if you don't have a joke that lands, it brush it off and try again. The wild style freestyle rap roasts would wrap up the game, and some would be genuinely pretty brutal. Me without my perm is an example. What you need to do is try to do a song without a sample. And some would remind me of the situation at the Comedy Central roasts. But it's not to propose. I'm just trying to fit the shoe over your big ass toes. You're a chick, right? 
Okay. Wait, what are you gonna do? My favorite thing they would do is called the family reunion as the teams would make their way through the crowd, finding a random person and introduce them to the rhythm of the song with the whole crowd clapping along. And you'd hope that your quick few bar rhyme would be harsh enough and or funny enough for a point and reaction from the crowd. Dudes be wearing wigs. <laughs> Reunion. It's a really fun show that you can find some good laughs with, some really clever roasts, and a bunch of celebrities joining in on the fun. If you're a fan of improvisational comedy, then this show is literally the show for you. If I said you had an amazing body, would you hold it against me? To see it still going on after all these years is genuinely impressive. Which now we have to ask the question, what will the higher amount be in the end? The amount of seasons of Wild and Out? or the amount of kids Nick Cannon will have. And be sure to click that subscribe button. Well, MTV truly has such a long list of interesting shows from weird to wild to cringe, and between my last MTV video and this one, we have covered a lot of them, from the more obscure and small ones to more well-known and longer-lasting ones. Clearly, there are still some missing, and I may have a part three in mind, but I do have some standalone videos for stuff like Jersey Shore in the works, so when you see people who comment Comment down below on this video. Why didn't he say this show? Where was Jersey Shore? I didn't see Silent Library. Well, you and I know that those are eventually coming, and some people here just don't have good attention spans. And that's it for this time on our MTV Look Back for today. Thanks so much for watching. Remember to leave a like and subscribe for more like this. Later. Awesome, weird. <laughs>